the infallibility of the laity. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to the Guild family stream. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Thank you to all of our Guild family. Your support helps us do this whole apostolate because we have mouths to feed and bills to pay. We can't do this apostolate without your help. So please remember to invoke our patrons every day for this whole apostolate. And we thank you for your financial support. As always, we will release the first part of this whole guild stream. I think it'll be about an hour, an hour and a half total about the infallibility of the laity. We'll release the first 10, 15 minutes for free online on YouTube. and we're trying to promote guild membership. So if you want the full treatment, you can become a guild member. Just a reminder, a reminder to guild members, all of the guild family streams are available. There's currently 137 of them. At the link that you should have received when you became a guild member, if you don't have the link, just reach out to me on Patreon or Locals or Telegram, wherever you access the guild content. So today's topic, the infallibility of the laity and all your questions. So I'm sorry if you if you sent in questions or comments after about 11 a.m. Eastern time. I haven't been able to look at anything since that time. Um, so feel free to offer up your thoughts, questions throughout this whole conversation. Hello to Aaron. Hello to Robert. Um, welcome, everybody. So let's get into our conversation. So, <clears throat> the infallibility of the laity. So, first of all, before I get into all of this, want to do my protestation, which is, this is what we publish in all of our books at Our Lady of Victory Press, at least those books which have any doctrinal comment, content. So, we're going to be talking about a doctrine about theology. So, just so everyone knows, I submit all of this to the authority of the Roman Church, and I welcome correction. This is not something that is very well known, but I do believe it is a de fide non definita dogma of the faith. And we'll talk about that. And uh, another disclaimer is that what I say here may or may not reflect the opinions and viewpoints of other the, ho the other hosts at Meaning of Catholic. Meaning of Catholic is a collaborative effort. I'm just one man. Obviously, I'm the founder and, and manager, whatever, but. Other people are part of Meaning of Catholic. They don't necessarily agree with me on all things. And as I said, this is a preliminary hypothesis, which I submit to the authority of the church. Nevertheless, at the same time, uh, there are certain things that a father must do because he has a duty from Almighty God. This is something that the clerical magisterium confirms, comes directly from God to parents, and they don't have to ask anybody's permission to do it. And that's a part of this. At the same time, there are aspects of this which are dubia. There are, there are matters of dubia that the theologians, they need to work that out. Let the theologians do that. That's fine. I'm not a theologian. I'm a father. And I'm speaking as a father. I'm not speaking as a theologian. But what I'm saying is in accordance, as far as I know, with the sacred tradition of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. 
And thank you to Aaron. He's right here. You're, you're the one who provided the main topic for this whole Guild family stream. So thank you to Aaron. And so let's talk about this. Here is the agenda. First, we'll go into our Guild member comments, the best comments. There's two very, very great comments I want to get into. Miscellaneous questions, Eastern Rites versus Melkite Maronite. Then we'll talk about the Sense of Fidelium. The Sense of Fidelium is not the same thing as the infallibility of the laity, but they are related. That'll be the end of our public portion. And then we'll have interlude number one. Why the Luminous Mysteries are totally trad, bro. We'll talk about that in our first interlude. And then we'll talk more about the Sense of Fidelium applied to current news and controversies. We'll talk about the, uh, there was a recent critique of the Pew Research poll regarding the the belief in the real presence from uh, Guild member Wesley. He had some comments on that. And Guild member Matt, he had some comments about Paglia murdering the elderly and the sick. We'll talk about that controversy from the Pontifical Academy for Death, a.k.a. or they call it the Pontifical Academy for Life, but um, unfortunately it's not. Also, the SSPX has been in the news once again. Interesting comments from a Swiss bishop. And then we'll have another interlude. Anime. Is it Antichrist or awesome? I Somebody want to talk about anime. So uh, we'll talk about that as well. It's uh, guild member Brett. We'll uh, discuss the uh, the dogmatic content of, of that important topic. And then we'll get into our main topic, which is the infallibility of the laity, which will be applying the doctrines contained in Vatican II sources. So I, I'm going to attempt to prove this hypothesis using Vatican II sources. So this will be uh, one of the sources here. Here's all here's all the sources for this conversation. Uh, we have the magisterial sources, tradition, Denzinger, uh, various dogmatic formulations, one anathema. Maybe you can see that better if I, yeah. So we also have a, a general address from Pope Benedict and also an official address from Pope Francis, which will help prove what I'm about to say. Also Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum, obviously Vatican II documents. Now, there's an interesting document that's very recent. It's called the Census Fide in the Life of the Church. That This comes from a body called the International Theological Commission. So what this is, is what I what I call here, it's not a magisterial source. Nevertheless, it's not the same thing as a secondary source. So the secondary source is down here. Uh, the primary secondary source I'm citing from is a, is a brand new book from Emmaus Academy, um, which is called The Faith Once Delivered. Sorry, the faith once for all delivered. That is a, a very, very good text, very important text, uh, which I'll be citing from the essay and the census fidelium in this text, as well as the uh, Vincentian canon. We'll talk about that. Um, but this is a secondary source, which is distinguished sharply from a magisterial source. Obviously, this is not a magisterial source, but uh, this is a number of authorities, people who are officially theologians in the church, their job is to comment and assist the magisterium. That's what a true theologian does. That's what the office of a theologian is and it has been for centuries. It's not merely an academic. Uh, unfortunately, that's another story. You can read my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible, all about the, the downfall of the office of the theologians. But that means it needs to be sharply distinguished from magisterial sources on the one hand, but also authoritative commentary. So the International Theological Commission is a body that is a, more or less the official theologians in the Vatican. Now, so this is not, so it's not just anybody, any old publisher, even though we you know we love Emmaus Academic, this is very good, but Emmaus Ad Academic has less authority than the International Theological Commission. Nevertheless, that commission is not a magisterial body. It is more or less an, an official commentary of theologians who are approved by the church and blessed by the hierarchy. It's kind of similar to the, the international theological dialogue between East and West. They put out documents as well. Those are not magisterial either, but they're, they're kind of like the official theologian theological commentary. So our level of assent towards this thing would be higher. Our piety towards this commission would be higher than, you know, just a book from uh, like Father Chad Ripperger is also a good authority. All these secondary sources, these are all good authorities. Ludwig Ott, obviously, a very good authority. St. John Henry Newman, very good authority. But 
those authorities are lesser than the authoritative commentary, as well as the highest authority, obviously, is the magisterial sources, the greatest of which is tradition, which includes both scripture and tradition. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so best comments by guild members. Trinity had a fantastic comment in which she defines Unite the Clans. I thought this was brilliant. She says this, quote, I think God may be allowed both orders there for a reason. So we're talking about the FSSP and the SSPX. The FSSP is able to bring in people that wouldn't have been brought into tradition without it being canonically regular. That was my family and I at one point. Well, the SSPX is able to more directly pull out the doctrinal errors of the church crisis by giving the faithful a detailed understanding of what is happening and directly talking to the hierarchy to try to help them out of their mistakes. Of course, they'll bring in other people too. So it, it essentially brings in different people to the tradition. The SSPX and the FSSP both bring people to the tradition, to the sacred Roman rite of our forefathers. And yet they do it. They're sort of different markets. And, and I think the laity, as, as I say here, uh, the laity often should I mean we the laity should not get into these vitriolic debates between SSPX versus FSSP ultimately because it's not our job to resolve these clerical questions. The clerical the clerics need to resolve those canonical questions and the theological debates, all these different things. As far as us parents, we just want the Latin mass. If the FSSP does it or the SSPX does it, whatever, let the clerics figure out their issues and their divisions or whatever, canonical, full and human, full, whatever it is. Let them work that out. That's their job. As for us, we want the Latin mass. Uh, so I really love what uh, Trinity said about that. Uh, another great comment here is from Sherry. She says this, I want the Lord given the love he deserves. So I long for, so this is, she was thinking about Nova Soto versus Latin mass. I really like what she said here. I want the Lord given the love he deserves. So I long for him to be worshipped in traditional liturgies. Secondly, I want souls to be shown what true love looks like, like which traditional liturgies reveal. Thirdly, I adore the Lord's patience for offering milk to souls so far from him in this broken world of ours. Perhaps the Novus Ordo is not what a response of love to God looks like, but it can be what love from God looks like. Lord, make our hearts like unto thine. This is a this is a fantastic comment because it really illustrates the fact that there are many, you know, as trads, I, obviously I'm a trad, even though meaning of Catholic is not officially trad, but it's very important that trads need to recognize that there are many faithful Catholics worshiping in the Novus Ordo. This is why I, I utterly reject the uh, pejorative term neo-Catholic. Uh, I think it's extremely, it's it's not good. It's uncharitable, it's divisive, it's inaccurate. Um, and ultimately, even a perfect Latin mass, which has all the smells and bells and Gregorian chant and everything, if that is offered to Almighty God with a Pharisaic heart of pride, that mass is a stench in the nostrils of the Lord because of your prideful heart. As the Lord says, God is spirit and truth. He, God is spirit. He seeks the worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. And the a, a, a childlike, humble heart offering the Novus Ordo Mise is more acceptable to Almighty God than a Pharisee offering the Latin Mass. And this is important. Very, very important that we, we recognize this. This is from Isaiah chapter 1. Go read Isaiah chapter 1 and, and tremble before Almighty God so that we do not fall into pride and prideful judging of our brethren. So let's continue. Miscellaneous guild member question from Matt. Eastern rites, Melkite or Maronite? Well, if you're going to different Eastern rites, there are, there are 24 different Catholic churches, and there are even more different rites of the church. Most of the diversity is in the East, so there's all these different... Uh, Eastern liturgies, and most of these Eastern liturgies have the smells and bells that we, uh, many trads, look for in the East. And it is really, it goes from somewhat parish to parish in some ways, but the differences are not at all the same 
so, sort of parish to parish that you would get from Novus Ordo Parish, Novus Ordo Parish, unfortunately. There's there's sort of a suburban right Novus Ordo sort of thing that's very common, but there's also a wide divergence in a given diocese in the celebration of the Roman right according to the new right. Now, I have heard, I have actually never been to a Maronite right, but I have heard that the Maronites are among the Eastern rites that some of them have suffered from some liturgical abuses. So unfortunately, we need to be careful about that in the Maronite rite. The Melkite rite is the Arab rite, the Antiochians. I was Antiochian Orthodox when I was, when I was Eastern Orthodox. And so they're going to have uh, the Greek rite of St. John Chrysostom. But if you go to the Ukrainians, they're going to have the same rite, but in Slavonic or depending on where you are or in English or in modern Ukrainian, uh, I believe I correct me if I'm wrong, some of my Ukrainian Catholic brethren, but they're also going to have more uh, Latin devotions as well. Some of them will have the Sacred Heart devotion of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Um, so there is some diversity, but it, it really depends on where you are. I mean, you can just go to the liturgy on Sunday and see what it's like, but the Maronite rite and the Melkite rite are different. So let's continue. So let's talk about census fidelium. What is it? The census fidelium is different than the infallibility of the laity. So we're not talking about the same thing here. But in order to talk about the latter, we have to talk about the former. Now, here I'm going to cite the faith once delivered, which is that Emmaus Press book that I just mentioned. And from the essay by Robert Dodaro, I believe he's a priest, Father Robert Dodaro, and his text, his essay, Census Fidelium Sense of the Faithful. Now, here is a quote that he provides two different quotes, which define these two, these three different terms, the three different terms. So there's can be some confusion. So there's census fidei, census fidelium, and consensus fidelium. Okay, so census fidei, census fidelium, and consensus fidelium, three different things. Now, this is summarized by this quotation here, given by Dodaro, which says this, quote, the term census fidei, so that means sense of the faith, the sense of the faith, faith considered as an object. The census fidei refers to the instinct possessed by the individual baptized and, and um, committed Christian, enabling him or her to recognize what is genuinely of the faith. So the census fidei is in, in the in the Roman rite baptism. There is the question where the priest says, what do you seek? And the godparents say faith. And faith is the theological virtue which is imparted at baptism. So the little child receives the census fidei. So he's been baptized. But then the other aspect is that he's committed. He's a committed Christian. So you have to be baptized, but you also have to be faithful which brings up the next one. This is the census fidelium. Now, this is the sense of the faithful considered as the faithful, meaning the people, the people who are the faithful. The census fidelium refers to the communal dimension of this instinct. So all the faithful who are baptized, so everybody who's baptized and committed Christian, everyone, and we're talking about Catholics, by the way, we're not just talking about all Christians because a baptized Christian, baptism is what makes you a Christian, but you can be a heretic. Therefore, you're not committed. So a committed Christian, a baptized and committed Christian would be a Catholic. So the sense of fidelium is all of the faithful, everybody who is baptized, faithful Catholic throughout all time. And this is what creates the distinction with the consensus fidelium. Continuing with the quote, it says consensus fidelium refers to the agreement and judgment because of the census fidelium regarding what is faithful to the apostolic heritage. Now, I added into this quote in brackets, if you look on the screen here, consensus fidelium refers to a given time. Whereas the census fidelium is timeless. And this is what is what is clarified by Dodaro's other quote from Herbert for Grimler. Because the consensus fidelium is something that arises at a given time. And this is what Dodaro, he doesn't emphasize in th this essay, I think because he's, he's focusing on another question. But 
the the distinction which seems to be the, the, the main distinction between the consensus fidelium and the census fidelium is one of time. So there's the census fidei. Everybody gets the census fidei by their baptism if they remain faithful and they're a faithful Catholic. Everybody ha has the census fidei, the sense of the faith, this instinct of the faith, this supernatural illumination. That's why the in, in the early church and the Greek rite, especially the uh, baptism is called the illumination. And so newly baptized faithful are called the illu the newly illumined servant of God, so-and-so, and the newly illumined handmaid of God, so-and-so, because they've been illuminated by baptism. They've been illuminated by the light of faith via baptism. But if they're faithful, then they can join and have the census fidelium, which is joining every faithful Christian throughout all time and space and all those who are alive today breathing, they all have the census fidei and make up the communal aspect of the census fidelium. Now, if you were to find all of those people who are alive today of the census fidelium, that would be the consensus fidelium. So those are all the, the faithful who are alive today. So the consensus fidelium is a subset of the census fidelium. Now, a little Latin, just to clarify a few things. The, as I said, fidei comes from fides, fides, which means faith. So census fidei is sense of the faith, whereas fidelium is of the faithful. So it's a plural noun from fideles, and it's used equivocally. And this is little, this is why it's a little complicated, a little confusing. Fideles or fidelium can mean in some contexts a distinction between clerics and lay people. So in, in a few of the documents that we're going to quote later on, the magisterial text is making a distinction between the church authorities on the one hand, namely the clerics, the bishops, and the faithful on the other hand. So the term faithful can mean, this is what I think vernacularly, at least in English in the United States, often the term faithful is referring to the lay people as opposed to the clerics. So we're making using the term faithful in in the sense of lay people versus clerics, the faithful versus the clerics. Now, on the other hand, clearly the definition of census fidelium includes clerics, too, because clerics are obviously baptized. And if they're faithful, they're part of this uh, possessing this census fidelium. So we have the. That's an important thing to keep in mind. So the context, so there's two different, a few different magisterial documents I will quote here later on as a part of the guild part, not the public part. But in those documents, the context gives you the answer as to what is meant by the faithful. All right, does it mean everybody, every single baptized Christian, or does it mean just the lay people? So there, so this is, this is what gives us the clue that there's already this distinction that helps us to understand the infallibility of laity and the relationship of the infallibility of the laity to the infallibility of the census of Delium. So we'll talk about that in the Guild Family Stream. Now, there was a question from Guild member Colin. Is this the passive infallibility of believing? And according to Parente et al. Dictionary of Dogmatic Theology, 1951, it appears no. And this is a, a, an entirely different distinction that really is not what we're getting at here, actually. But what's interesting, I'll, I'll quote it again, what's uh, a, an interesting look. But there is a ter there's a terminological innovation that happens in the modern period before Vatican II between the Ecclesia do chains and the Ecclesia D chains, which is where the Ecclesi Ecclesia do chains, so it's making a distinction between the current magisterium now living and the current lay people now living. So one is the church teaching, the current magisterium alive today, and the current faithful, the current lay people now alive today. Those are the church uh, learning. So there's the church teaching and the church learning. And here's the quote from Parente. It says that the faithful, insofar as they are recipients of this teaching in terms of the act of so what this is distinguishing between active and, active and passive infallibility. So 
The bishops united with the Pope in their teaching enjoy active infallibility, infallibility in their teaching, whereas the faithful, insofar as they are recipients of this teaching and assimilate the doctrine without error, enjoy a sort of reflex infallibility called the, by theologians passive infallibility, infallibility in believing. So this has to do with this distinction between the church teaching and the church learning. It's it's not getting at the, the other distinctions that I'm, I'm getting at when, when we're talking about the census fidelium. So it's really a, 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 an entirely separate form of distinguishing the magisterium. It, it's not as at the same time directly related to the, the census fidelium as, as we are distinguishing it right now. Now, what's very interesting is that, and, and the reason why this is so critical that we understand the true census fidelium is because look, look at this quote here from the ITC. So this is the, that, this is the authoritative commentary that I was referring to the theological commission. What's very interesting is that it has this in English at least. So there's no Latin text because the, unfortunately the clerics and the, the magisterium has lost its own language in Vat in the Vatican, which is lamentable. So the um, most, as far as I know, the most, most of these theological commission documents, the official text is German. But there are also original, the I believe is the Amazon document was originally put out in Spanish as the as the sort of critical text. So there's no Latin text to give us the sort of the more official version of this because this English is problematic. Here's what the census fidelium document says, quote. Banishing the caricature of an active hierarchy and a passive laity. And in particular, the notion of a strict separation between the teaching church, Ecclesia Docenes, and the learning church, Ecclesia Decenes, the council, i.e. Vatican II, taught that all the baptized participate in their own proper way in the three offices of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. So we're going to talk about the quotation that is implied here, but notice how problematic this is. Did, did the council really banish a previously established magisterial or theological teaching or distinction really did, did the did it really banish that well i i would claim according to i actually a few nights ago we were just talking to a, a very very good theologian who explained to us uh how the uh the, the rules of theological interpretation are such that what has been what has been uh, established and what has been passed down cannot be banished unless there's an explicit explicit banishment if we have a tradition and something that's been passed down the magisterium does not banish it unless it explicitly says so and i mean this is kind of like common sense you know you can see this in secular law you know if you have a law that's established it can't be revoked or abrogated unless it's explicitly said you know so it's it's already problematic for this document to even claim that that's happened now I have a there's a clue as to why this was put into this document, because at the same time, it's quite clear that the the census fidelium doctrine is being used to promote evil because there is an abyss between the true and the false census fidelium. Here we'll quote we'll quote his holiness himself, Pope Francis, December 6, 2013, he says this, quote, of course, it is clear that the census fidelium must not be confused with the sociological reality of majority opinion. It is something else, end quote. Because the schism on schismness and the schismatic way, which some call the synod on citadelity in the synodal way, it's clearly being weaponized against the faith. And this is something that's confirmed by mainstream higher ups, hierarchs like Cardinal Muller, Cardinal Pell, rest in peace. This is being used as a weapon, as a hostile takeover against the faith. That's what Cardinal Muller called it. This is a schism on schismness, is what it is. And they're using a false version of census fidelium to overcome the faith because they're identifying it with a majority opinion. They're polling everybody, polling the laity, and oh, hey, the majority opinion is against contraception. Well, that's the census fidelium, or the majority opinion wants to ordain women. Oh, well, that's the census fidelium. Census fidelium is infallible. So there we go. And we see how this works because 
This is exactly how Father James Martin argues. There is a, a article we put out at 1 Peter 5 called James Martin Does Teach Heresy Response to Trent Horn, in which it quotes that uh, Martin, James Martin says, well, the teaching on the teaching on homosexuality by the church has not been received by the gay community. The teaching of the of homosexuality by the church has not been received by the gay community, so therefore it's not a part of the census fidelium. Well, I'm not a theologian, he says, but I mean, come on, it's not the census fidelium. You see, this is exactly what they do, and this is what they're doing right now with the schism on schismness. So it's very clear that there is a conspiracy of the fallen angels weaponizing the true doctrine of the census fidelium to impose heresy by means of modernism, which claims to be the census fidelium. And both of these, the true and false census fidelium, are different than the infallibility of the laity, which we'll get to. So in just a minute, we're going to cover the current news, Pew Research Poll Critique, Peglia, Murdering Elderly and Sick, even anime, as well as the SSPX comments from the Swiss Bishop. And also, don't forget why the Luminous Mysteries are super trad, bro. And we'll continue in just a minute. So this is the end of the public portion. If you want this full stream, you have to become a guild member meaningofcatholic.com slash register. Guild members get the entire Guild Family Stream Master List, 137 videos, as well as this one, which will be up when you register and gain access to the full stream. Back in a minute.